Do any of you remember this guy? Dmitry Mendeleev, or Mendeleev, or however you want to pronounce it. This was the guy that developed the periodic table as we know it. Up to this point, we have discussed kinda sorta uh, the reason why the uh, periodic table is arranged the way it is. Uh, but we're going to get more into that now. We're going to get more into why elements that have similar properties, uh, well, more specifically, we're going to talk about why there are elements that have similar properties. Um, the reason why they're next to each other is just because we decided to put them there, but um, why would certain elements have similar properties in the first place? That is something we're going to get into here. Um, so this um, idea that there were elements with similar properties was not really something that was discovered by Mendeleev. He was just really the first one that was put it together that you could arrange the elements in such a way where you had elements with similar properties next to each other, and that would actually give you a way of even predicting the existence of elements that were unknown at that point. Uh, Mendeleev actually predicted the existence of germanium, uh, which had not been discovered at that point, but he did, he called it echosilicon at the time because it's down there below silicon, and he predicted with a decent amount of accuracy um, the properties of germanium. So we haven't discussed why these things, why these properties reoccur yet. So that's what we're going to get into here. And the reason for them, the reason why you have something like fluorine that has a similar, uh, similar types of properties as chlorine, which has similar types of properties as bromine, is because their electron configurations are similar. And when you have elements with similar electron configurations, they are going to have similar chemistries. They're not going to be exactly the same, obviously, but they are going to be similar. So that's what we're going to look at here. So, the orbitals that electrons occupy determine the properties of the element, and more specifically, the orbitals that the outermost electrons occupy will determine the properties of the atom. We call these outermost electrons, the ones that are the farthest away from the nucleus, the valence electrons. Uh, and we're going to come back to valence electrons later on in this chapter, but just for now, um, try to remember that the outermost electrons are the most important when it comes to chemistry, and we call these valence electrons. But before we can talk about those kinds of electrons specifically, we need to talk just more in general about how we write, how we determine an electron configuration. Um, so we need, to, we need to take a look at the forest before we can take a look at the individual trees in the forest. So let's talk about um, how we actually write an electron configuration. So there's two different ways that we can do this. There's the uh, way that I call the linear version, which is normally just called an electron configuration. Um, and then there is the orbital diagram, which technically speaking is still an electron configuration. Um, it's just a, a more detailed one, um, the orbital diagram. In the orbital diagram, you can actually, uh, there's enough information to sign uh, to assign all four uh, quantum numbers to an electron, whereas in an electron configuration, you really only get the information for two of those quantum numbers, uh, which should make sense here in just a second. So with that linear form, just the plain old electron configuration, what you do is you write out each of the subshells that have electrons in them, and you write how many electrons are in those subshells. So for example here with hydrogen, hydrogen only has a single electron. We are always going to work under the assumption that uh, the electrons are in the lowest possible orbitals that they could be. Um, the universe is lazy, everything wants to be at the lowest possible energy level, and so um, it's not a terrible assumption to make. This, by the way, is what we call the ground state. So if you, as a person, were in your ground state, you might literally be lying on the ground. 
Um, you're as low down as you can get. Um, same thing here with these electrons. They're in as low an energy state as possible. That is their ground state. Um, and so when we're writing out these electron configurations, we're always just going to be starting at the lowest possible energy subshells and then filling upwards. We're not going to have two electrons in the 1s and then just some random electron up in the, uh, the 5p or something like that. So we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. So again, with these, all we're doing is any subshell that has electrons in it, we write the uh, representation for that subshell, which is always the, uh, the principal number and then the letter for the uh, subshell number. And again, those are S, P, D, F. Those are really the only four that we're ever going to look at. Uh, which correspond to 0, 1, 2, and 3 for the L values, just to remind you from the last video. So we write this representation, and then as a coefficient, we put the number of electrons in that subshell. So hydrogen having just one electron in the lowest possible energy orbital, which is the 1s, would be 1s1 one electron in the 1s. And so then as we work our way upwards from hydrogen, helium is the next one. That's element number two. We'll have two electrons. Each of the orbitals, if you remember, can hold two electrons. This was the, the Pauli exclusion principle. You can have two electrons in the same orbital as long as one of them is spin up and the other one is spin down. So each orbital can hold two electrons. The 1s, having one orbital, can hold two electrons. And so both of the electrons in helium can go in the 2s. This little pointer thing does not always work as well as I want it. So that is helium, 1s2. Two electrons in the 1s. Um, and as we just keep going to larger and larger elements, we will add on from one uh, subshell to the next, to the next. Um, and so as you can see here, if we skip ahead, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but like with phosphorus, for example, which is right there, we have, uh, let's see, how many electrons will be? 13? Yeah, so we have 13 electrons. Uh, and so we have two in the 1s, two in the 2s, 6 in the 2p, because if you remember, the p subshells have three orbitals, two electrons for each, so that gives us a, uh, a, a total possibility of six electrons being in p, uh, in a p subshell. So we have 2p6, 3s2, and then 3p3. And so we're just filling in with the lowest, <coughs> excuse me, the lowest energy and working our way up. So these are electron configurations. Orbital diagrams are very similar. They follow all the same rules as uh, electron configurations. They're just more detailed because instead of just giving the number of electrons in a subshell, you actually draw out all the individual orbitals and show each electron in those orbitals. Usually this is done using boxes as your uh, subshells. So this is how I would draw something like a, this would be the 1s, this is the 2s, this would be the 2p. If you remember the s subshells have only a single orbital so they get a single box. The p subshells have three orbitals so it has three boxes and I have them connected together just to show that they are all in the same subshell together. Sometimes you'll see uh, examples where people like will use circles and uh, oops, and they'll just have um, do it this way. So like this would be the 1s, 2s, and then they'd have the 3p kind of next to each other, but not necessarily connected like the boxes. I prefer this. I think this is clearer. So we'll just pretend like that doesn't exist. Um, and so the orbital diagrams allow you to see each individual electron in a uh, configuration. 
and so the spin up electrons are a little half arrow pointing upwards and the spin down electrons are a half arrow pointing downwards. And we'll do a lot more uh, with that practice with these in uh, maybe not in this video, but maybe in the next video. And so if it's not entirely clear what we're doing here, it should become more clear as we start doing some examples. Uh, but before we can do those, we have to talk about some more rules for writing these because there are rules. We can't just uh, throw them in randomly. So the first rule here we've actually already talked about, the Pauli exclusion principle. So this is just telling us that no two electrons can sit in the same uh, orbital with the same spin. So you can have two electrons in the same orbital, but they have to be opposite in spin. Uh, another way of saying it is that you can't have all four of the numbers be the same. Um, so these are perfectly fine, even though these three numbers here are the same, because this last one is different, this one is positive and this one is negative, it's perfectly fine. So as long as you don't have uh, on an orbital diagram something like this, where they're both spin up, that is bad, um, you can have two electrons in there as long as they are pointed in opposite directions. So you have opposite spins. The next thing here is the relative energy of orbitals. This is called the, uh, I believe, the off-bow principle or off-bow principle. Um, I forget the uh, exactly how it's pronounced, but essentially what this uh, tells us is how the subshells split up. For something that is really, really simple, like hydrogen, there actually isn't any splitting for the sublevels. What that means is in hydrogen that has a single uh, electron, the 3s, 3p, and 3d subshells all have the exact same energy. They would be degenerate, all three of those subshells. But as soon as you have more than one electron, as soon as you have a multi-electron atom, those sublevels split. They're not all the same energy. Now, the S is the lowest energy, P is higher in energy, and D is even higher than that. And it just keeps going higher as you go to more complicated shapes with those subshells. Um, and so, practically everything we are going to do, and actually I'll just go ahead and say everything <laughs> we are going to do. We're not going to write the electron configuration for hydrogen. Um, everything we're going to do is going to be multi-electron. And so we will always have splitting of the subshells. Now this wouldn't be terribly complicated if, even though they were split, the individual shells stayed away from each other. So just to clarify what I'm saying there, it wouldn't be a big deal if you had something like you, you have the 3s, the 3p, and the 3d, and you had all three of those, and then the next highest energy thing was the, the very first lowest energy subshell in the fours, in the fourth shell. So again, that's our fourth um, uh, row of pallets in our, our uh, warehouse analogy. So if all of these were lower in energy than the 4s, it wouldn't really be all that much trouble because we could just do all the 1s, do all the 2s, do all the 3s, then do all the 4s. Fortunately, it is not that simple. They do overlap. And so as you can see here, for the beginning, they actually do follow that print, the, uh, the idea that just all the 1s are first and then all the 2s. So 1 is obviously much lower than 2 and all of the 2s are lower than all of the 3s, but once you get to the 3, the 3s is the next lowest in energy, 3p is after that, but 3d is actually higher in energy than 4s. So because of this splitting of the sublevels, the 3d orbitals are higher in energy, and so when you're filling in an electron configuration, you're actually going to put electrons into the 4s, before you put them into the 3D. And then it just gets more complicated from that point forward. So 4S goes to 3D, 4P is next after that, but then 4D is not after that, 5S is after that, and then 4D, and then it's, it's even more complicated from there, because then you start getting 
um, the F's mixing in. Um, so you'll have 4F in there, which is going to be higher than uh, some of the 5's, which they're gonna, it's going to get messy. Uh, thankfully though, you do not have to memorize the order, uh, which is what it's getting at here. You do not want to memorize the order. It's too hard. Uh, what, what's that uh, online abbreviation? Uh, TLDR, too long, didn't read, too hard, didn't memorize. Um, we do not have to memorize this. Instead, we have a nice little trick to remembering the correct order, and that is this. So this thing, and actually, let me erase that line. I did not mean to write the line through the other lines here. Um, so what that is showing us is if you write out all of the subshells in kind of a triangular shape here. So you put all the S's in one line, then you put the P's in the next, and D, and then F. You're not going to have uh, P subshells for everything, D subshells. Remember, the, the first sublevel, or first uh, main shell, only has the S. You're going to add another one of those sublevels with each uh, shell that you go to. And so it is going to just naturally give you kind of a, a triangular shape. And we've left off some stuff down here. So this technically should be the 7P, um, 7D, 7F. This should be 6F. But we're never going to get up to that, that high of a, a subshell. And so that's why it's left off, even though they are technically there. But we just, it would be kind of cruel of me to make you write an orbital diagram that goes up to like 150 electrons or something like that. So we're just never going to get that high. Um, you'll you'll for sure use up all your electrons before you get to the 7p. So the way you can figure out the correct order for putting electrons into your configuration is to follow this diagonal line. So you just draw diagonal lines starting in the top corner, top right corner. Just draw a diagonal line through the uh, subshells, and then when you get to the end, which in the case of this first one here, it's just, you know, just the one. You go back up to the top right corner and draw another diagonal line. Then go back up, draw another diagonal line. Back up, another diagonal line. And so as you're drawing this diagonal line, the order in which you intersect these sublevels is the correct order for the energy levels of those subshells. So you can see here, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. 4s comes before we loop around again and get to 3d. And so as you go through the list here, 3d to 4p to 5s, back up to 4d, 5p, 6s, 4F, 5D, 6P, 7S. You can see here how the, the order does get a bit wonky as you're going through there. Um, but as long as you have this handy guide here, you should not have trouble working out the correct order. So the last rule, before we start doing some examples in the next video here, is Hund's rule. What Hund's rule tells us is that if you are filling in electrons in an orbital diagram, you always put the electrons in singly first with parallel spins. So the example here, we have two electrons to put into the 2p. It is incorrect to put both of them in the same orbital. Electrons have similar charges. They don't want, really like being next to each other if they don't have to be. And so you're going to put, give them their own uh, orbital inside the subshell. And for quantum mechanical reasons that we will not get into at this point, it is much more stable, well, I shouldn't say much, it is, it is more stable for them to be, uh, to have parallel spins. They could both be up or both be down, actually either one is, is perfectly fine. Um, I think just by convention most people will show them going up first just to, you know, be positive. They're up spin. But it's not incorrect to have them going down, as long as both of them are down. So that is Hund's rule. If you're putting in electrons into a subshell like this, put them in singly first, 
with parallel spins. So give each electron its own orbital until you have to pair them up. So if we were going to put uh, five electrons into the 2p, or actually let's not even say that, let's just say we got to this point here. We'd put in this many electrons, but we still had two more electrons to put in. We would put the first of those two into this subshell. We would not then say, okay, well they don't like having some another electron there. They like to have parallel spins. So I'm going to go ahead and put the next one in the 3s. We would not do that. It is much better much more energetically favorable to go ahead and put that electron here, pair up one of them, than to put it in a whole next subshell. That is, um, and actually in that case it would be even a whole new shell. That is a much bigger energy jump than just making them pair up. Um, so we never leave a subshell empty like that if we still have electrons to give. All right, hope that makes sense. Um, in the next video here, we'll start off by looking at a few examples here um, for the uh, more simple elements. One, uh, I think that's three through, yeah, three through ten. And then we will do some examples. So I will see you in the next video.